Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Larry Cantor, for those of you who don't know me, uh, chief curator here at the gallery. And it is my <clears throat> pleasant duty to welcome you this evening and to, to this inaugural program accompanying our most recently installed exhibition, James Prosek, Art, Artifact, Artifice, now on view upstairs in our fourth floor Sussman Galleries. Before beginning, I have been asked to insert a shameless promotional announcement, um, urging all of you to expect the imminent appearance of the book of the same title, due out, is, Tiffany, is it in April it's coming out? Yes, April. Um, those of you who know James will understand me when I say that um, the book is not a mere catalog of the exhibition. Um, it is a work of art in its own right. It is difficult to capture in any exhibition the uh, full scope of James's restless creativity. For one thing, to do him justice, it would be necessary to overwhelm each artwork with an explanatory label so long and complex that it would dwarf in size the object it accompanies. So we decided instead to do without explanatory labels of any kind and let the book do the talking. Um, we invited James to share with you some of his most riveting ideas and the stories of how he came upon them the stories that seduced me into agreeing to do this show in the first place. And we illustrated these with the displays you will see upstairs. Um, I'm sure you'll find both immensely enjoyable and deeply thought-provoking. Even more enjoyable and thought-provoking will be, I have no doubt, tonight's lecture, so generously sponsored by the Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund. Our speaker, Richard Prum, is the William Robertson Coe Professor of Ornithology in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology here at Yale University, and the Curator of Ornithology as well as Head Curator of Vertebrate Zoology at the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. <clears throat> it is seldom that we servants of the humanities have an opportunity to introduce our opposite numbers in the sciences. We never have opportunities to use as many syllables and titles as I've just shared with you um, for Rick. So it is difficult for me to wade through Rick's single-spaced, 21-page, book-length CV to pull out salient facts to share with you. But one in particular did strike me. In 2018, Rick was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in general nonfiction and in 2020, he was the winner of the Lewis Thomas Prize for writing about science, on both occasions in recognition of his book, The Evolution of Beauty, How Darwin's Forgotten Theory of Mate Choice Shapes the Animal World and Us. The title, I suspect, says it all, and ties in so poetically with James Prosek's vision of art, artistic creation, and the natural world. I hope <clears throat> that after the lecture, you will stay for a brief dialogue between Rick and James. It is sure to be an exchange not to be missed, and I hope it's captured on film. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Prum. Great. So uh, thank you very much, and a pleasure to be here and uh, to uh, both uh, think about and celebrate uh, uh, art, artifice, and, uh, and uh, James's work. Um, well, as, a, as an ornithologist, I've had the pleasure to work on lots of different uh, aspects of, uh, of avian biology. And it's uh, been a notable and uh, fascinating random walk. But I've come to find, especially over the years with my interaction in the, uh, in the humanities side of the campus, um, that over here we have these degree granting departments, but then there's also a lot of the intellectual action is in area studies, uh, you know, whether it's uh, women, gender, and sexuality, or Latin American studies, or uh, Asian studies, right? And I realized after a lot of exposure that my own take on ornithology was it's avian area studies. And, <laughs> And that, what that means is that sometimes it's physics and sometimes it's chemistry. Uh, it could be genetics, anatomy, systematics, behavior. 
uh, game theory, uh, and sometimes it's about aesthetics. That says sometimes the path I've been working in ornithology leads me clear outside of the sciences. Um, and what's the marvelous thing uh, about uh, spending enough decades in ornithology, and maybe now almost 15, 15 years or so at Yale, is uh, that that's a totally comfortable place to be. So I am happy to be here in the art museum talking about uh, 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 birds and, uh, and, and comedy. Um, so among the, the research questions I've been working on is on a, a, a particular aspects of the birds that function through the perceptions of other individuals. And uh, not just perceptions, but actually judgments or evaluations. And this has led to an explicitly aesthetic view of the evolutionary history and the, uh, indeed the social function of lots of aspects of the bird body including, and behavior, including the, the colors of, of this uh, marvelous uh, Katinga. And this has led to a research focus on the scientific idea that birds are beautiful because they're beautiful to themselves and that they're agents in their own uh, evolution through their social and sexual choices. Right? So what I want to do today, rather than focus just on that scientific work, is lead it, again, outside of the sciences to this realm that, uh, that, that, James and I, uh, that James and I share. I see the work I'm going to be talking about today and James's artwork and the curated uh, exhibit uh, upstairs as sort of parallel provocations uh, in the region or in the neighborhood of, of, of science, art, the humanities, uh, and, uh, and the history of uh, both evolutionary history and history of human craft in all those areas. Of course, this provocation asks us to ask lots of interesting, a whole series of questions. Or what is the boundary between uh, art and artifact, science and the humanities, nature, culture? Uh, what is art? Uh, what does it mean to present um, these scientific objects in, uh, from nature in a new way in the context of, 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 uh, of, of, of an art museum? Uh, and, and, how, um, and how, do we, how do we think about these things in a formal exhibit space together with contemporary art to new conceptions. And, and, and so that's what I want to explore. And, and what I think the, uh, the direction I'll take it in um, requires, uh, or uh, James' work is about a lot of things, and, but I'm going to reflect on, on one particular take where our more, uh, a scientific view uh, leads to um, a consideration of the complexity of what, of what, what, uh, what this work means. So uh, let's start with uh, another provocation, uh, display of birds itself. This is a, a Wayne's Parodia. This is a, a male courtship display. You see this really unusual bird has got a sort of black tutu of feathers six velvety bangles suspended in a crown above his head. And then he stopped to do this uh, sudden woggle uh, with his head, right? And, uh, and of course, this is shamelessly appealing to your sensory uh, complexity detectors uh, to, to, to imagine the complexity, right? And I, I, like I say, it's a provocation. It's taken one moment out of the life of a bird that's a member of a polygynous clade. Lots of biology we're going to uh, 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 over, over, overcome here, right, or, or, or ignore. So um, these and a whole class of similar uh, ornaments that I would be returning to are an example of what I consider to be aesthetic evolution, which is a special mode of evolution, a distinct mode of evolutionary change uh, that is an emergent consequence of three criteria, sensory perception, cognitive evaluation, and choice. And when those three things occur on a heritable substrate, we get a biological or even cultural mode of aesthetic change. And by aesthetic, I mean that the products of this process, aspects of the phenotype of the organism, the, the perceivable part of the organism, that function in, not in the, in, in the, in, in explicitly in the physical world, 
but in the perception by other individuals. So when we look at these, uh, the, the, the sexual ornaments of the, the plumage of the male cock of the rock, or the wood thrush, or the, uh, the social plumages, we can imagine social and sexual choices. Here, we'll be talking later about the choices made by parent birds as they arrive at the nest, perceive their offspring, evaluate them, and then make a choice. Which mouth gets the worm? Which bird gets fed, right? Which chick is the one that deserves that attention, right? These choices lead to aesthetic elaboration. And then and the choices that many organisms, including birds, make as they pollinate flowers or feed on fruits, right? Uh, so this aesthetic realm within evolution is one that I've been focusing a lot. Now, this science requires a bringing beauty back into the fold uh, outside of the, uh, uh, of, or uh, uh, you know, back into the network of science with a definition. And so I'm not merely talking about beauty today, uh, one of many uh, aesthetic values or properties that we could imagine, um, but it's still a special one. And so within this scientific realm, I would define beauty as not a, merely an attraction, but as a co-evolved attraction in which the form of the preference or desire and the object of those preferences have shaped one another over time. And it's this mutual interaction uh, that is at the core, I think, of the aesthetic and of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, this, this, this process in nature. Now, this science requires that we take the subjective experiences of animals and bring them to the center of our, of our science. Uh, this has been an area where lots of scientists have been afraid to talk about what is it like, really, to be a bat. We can talk functionally about how uh, they use sonar to create a 3D picture, et cetera. But that doesn't tell us or even begin to expose our science to that, to, that, to that subjective quality. And I'm saying that in order to get science right, we need to embrace the subjective element. Uh, we can't entirely uh, 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 um, describe it, but we need to uh, engage with it. And that means the sonar world of the bat, the olfactory world of the mole, or the electrical world of the more mirrored fish, a fish that swims in murky rivers in, in Africa. Uh, and creates electrical fields that it uses to sense the world around it. And then in addition, the males sing songs, electrical songs that vary in frequency and tempo, but in an entirely different wave that's insensible to us, like music, but electrical, right? So these are beyond our experiences uh, and impossible really for us to, to imagine. And it's not uh, 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 an accident that I'll be talking mostly about birds whose aesthetic uh, channels, if you will, modes of expression are very similar to our own uh, color and, and song. So as a result of, uh, of, of studying aesthetic evolution in, in all these ways, it has ultimately led me to an interaction with uh, the humanities. Originally, in an effort to try to um, advance a, a deeper uh, set of arguments to advocate for an aesthetic component within science, I started reading in, uh, in aesthetic philosophy. And uh, at first, I was highly confused. Uh, I didn't find that the field uh, had a set of, uh, set of questions or set of ways of framing the question even. And, uh, but eventually, I landed on some work that really grabbed me. And that was a, a, a classic paper, a classic paper by Arthur Danto uh, about Brillo box. And Danto was uh, a, 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 a Hegelian philosopher at that point at Columbia, already tenured, but he was a painter. Uh, and in 1964, he went to a famous show in the city, and he saw Brillo Box. And he was so stunned by it, he was stunned both as an artist and also as a philosopher. And what, what, uh, what Brillo Box uh, conjured was the idea that uh, here was an object that was materially identical or perceptually identical to a commercial box of Brillo that you'd find in the grocery store, and yet here it was in a fine art museum. How could that be? What was it? It what couldn't be the sensory qualities that made it a quality of art. Well, he wrote a brilliant paper on it that he called The Art World, and in that he proposed that suppose one thinks of a discovery of a whole new class of art as something analogous to the discovery of a new class of facts anywhere, viz. as something for, for theoreticians to explain. So here he was saying the new class of art was things that are perceptually indistinguishable from other things that are not art. Right? 
Uh, and what I'm going to propose is that this new class of artists may be things that we've been perceiving for a long time, but haven't considered uh, as art, that is, uh, uh, aesthetic, co-evolved aesthetic artifacts in the world. So when I re read Dantro, I reached the hubris moment, wow, maybe I actually can make contributions to aesthetic philosophy. So I have uh, done that, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes here. Uh, so in, in a 2013 paper, 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 I made a proposal that art is a form of communication that co-evolves with its evaluation. Now, uh, it would take me more than my time here today to defend that statement, but I'm going to take it and show you where it goes, where we can, what we can do with it. Um, um, what this means is this co-evolutionary feature uh, is, I think, something that's, that's, that's shared broadly. We can imagine that uh, you know, Mozart's aesthetic innovation by moving from one key into another within a single piece of music, uh, creating new dimensions of emotional uh, kind of content and impact, transformed his, his audience's capacity to imagine what music can be, which fed back through their subsequent evaluations on new music, giving rise to the classical style, right? Well, we can imagine similar sorts of things when we look at the peacock's tail or those courtship displays of the birds of paradise, that it is both the, uh, the ornament and the preferences which shape one another over time. So this coevolutionary feature, I think, is very broad. And what that means is that many bird songs Plumages, flowers, fruits, and other forms of uh, aesthetic expression in nature are biotic art forms, biological art forms. Uh, I think that Danto was correct in identifying that art is a population phenomena. Uh, and what that means is that nature is, uh, contains a myriad of other art worlds. Right? Um, within an aesthetic framework, we are used in the history of art to imagine that artworks themselves uh, can be revolutionary, can themselves transform what art can be, right? But what I, the co-evolutionary framework, this definition of art, would allow us to, or would require that we imagine that it's, these objects do not only require, or don't, don't just involve a transformation of art, but a a, a co-evolution co or a, a co-evolutionary transformation of the aesthetic. That in each case, um, these, um, uh, these artworks transformed uh, uh, the aesthetic and were transformed by evaluations. Uh, for example, commercial art, uh, cartoons, uh, 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 Hollywood, or the invention of photography and perhaps even pornography. So that the, it may have been that the aesthetic was the part that, were ch that was changing in advance of these, right? So this uh, requires, uh, this co view view uh, requires examining both the, the, the art and, and, and the aesthetic, the change in the evaluation. So what I'd like, like to do is with that today, or now, is to explore, that's a little loud, um, explore media and genre in avian art, right? Uh, so what are the media? The media are color, uh, uh, song, olfaction, um, and uh, 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 tactile, dance, movement, all sorts of uh, aspects of, of, uh, of sensory modalities. And the genres include not only taxonomic, uh, but social opportunities for choice. Uh, sexual choices like uh, those made by with thrush females choosing males based on their song, or uh, Cock of the Rock, or social cho choices, parental choices, or even ecological choices. Birds as agents through their uh, ecological choices in flowers and in fruits for the evol evolution of, 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 uh, of forms, and that these forms are myriad of art worlds. So I'm gonna start back with the Birds of Paradise. We see here a, uh, uh, another courtship display. And I'm, this is, again, is in the genre, we call it a, 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 the, the uh, a sexual display. But it's also a, 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 a visual attack. You'll see that the bird's eye is actually black right there. Right? Now this is, uh, what we see here, again, is both players. The male is about to do a courtship display. The female, who does all the nesting on her own, is about to visit him in, 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 at close scrutiny. So here she is in an intimate distance. I'm sorry. Now this, this is an, an, an amazingly complicated display. We've gone in lots of different ways. 
uh, about this. Uh, one, we could show that the happy face was not invented by 60s popular culture <laughs> here in New Haven, but evolved independently in, 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 in New Guinea in a totally different context. But what I want to do is focus, in this case, on, on, on media, on the production of these, of these signals. What we saw in that, in that case is, uh, is this incredible uh, hood of erected feathers with this vividly blue uh, 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 pattern uh, surrounded by a profoundly black surface. Right? Uh, and it turns out that over years, we've managed to do science on all aspects uh, of this. Uh, first, I want to talk about the blue, which is a structural color made by constructive interference from light waves bouncing off these arrays of parallel melanosomes in the barbules of these vividly blue feathers. So one set of light waves bouncing off one layer, another off another layer, and those two travel different distances. They go out of phase with one another. White light goes in, and only this incredibly pure blue light comes out. Right? So this is optical nanoscience of the birds. Right? Of course, uh, thinking back, how does this happen? Well, it's her preferences. It's her choices on the varieties of display that are giving rise to the origin of this technology. Now, what's equally amazing and the subject of recent research just in the last couple of years uh, is the super black feathers that surround these. These super black feathers uh, have specially shaped barbules that look kind of like uh, uh, oak leaves uh, curled up and, uh, on, a, on a barbecue skewer. Uh, and inside of them are a series of spaces. And what happens is the micro scale spaces where the light shines in and bounces back and forth and back, 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 and it almost never comes out. So we've shown that this material is the blackest objects ever measured in nature, right? These bird of paradise feathers. So here's a reflectance spectra, some data, uh, uh, two to four percent uh, reflectance across all visible wavelengths, including the UV where birds can see, and that these super black patches are orders of magnitude darker, right? They are really uh, this structurally enhanced black. Uh, they are almost as black as Vanta black. Here's an example of Vanta black. This is, these are two identical uh, um, uh, bronze sculptures, and one is painted with a material made of carbon nanotubes that has the same optical property of absorbing all of the light. So uh, this uh, bright, shiny object is rendered uh, insensible by this surface. Interestingly, in parallel, in order to do this research, you have to take the feathers and coat them with gold in order to put them in the electron microscope to, the, get, scope to get these images. And here is a regular black feather, and here's a super black feather. Even when you coat it with gold, it's still black, right? So that is a sort of physical proof of, of this thing. We've now found this not just in birds of paradise, but many families of birds. Uh, 15 family birds, and seeing if you're avid, uh, birds that you could see even here in Connecticut. So the question now is, why be super black? Why would you create a super black plumage? And uh, to illustrate this, I only have to refer to the blue dress, white dress thing that blew up the internet. What was that all about? What that was about was color correction. We are constantly taking in information about the ambient light and controlling or dividing or normalizing our color perceptions for the adequate light. And so why people saw these di dressed differently was that they had different opinions or perceptions about the nature of the ambient light shining on the dress. So uh, then why be super black? The answer is, uh, in short, Velvet Elvis. Um, <laughs> By eliminating, eliminating specular reflections, highlights like the, the shine coming off my nose or my glasses that uh, communicate to you that I am actually a three-dimensional object up here, uh, 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 we, we, that, and it's also telling you the color of the light ambient are shining on me. By eliminating uh, all specular reflectance around, you interrupt the female's capacity to ask how much light is shining on this object. And if there's more light coming from it than you think is ambient on it, then it will look like it's glowing with its own light. It will, sh it will stand out. Or if your brain will say, uh, there is no light on that surface, so this object that has so much light on it must be in a different place. And it will pop out from the background and, and float in an ambiguous place where that light must be. 
shining, right? And so these are both, these are kinds of uh, uh, both aesthetic impressions, but also uh, subjective impressions uh, have to do it. And, and just so we know, it's not just about Velvet Elvis. Other artists <laughs> have done this as well. Here is uh, one I saw a few years ago and couldn't forget, uh, Botticelli's portrait of Simonetta Vespucci as, as a nymph. So um, the other kinds of color contrast and color theory, of course, rich history here. And uh, I don't need to refer to it in this audience who, who know this work, I'm sure, better than I. But it's to say that we are not alone in exploring the interaction of uh, of, uh, of the uh, comparison aesthetically of different colors. Now, the next genre I want to talk to or is, is still in the, in the realm of sexual display by the construction of the bowerbirds, which are, by almost anyone's measure, the most aesthetically extreme uh, uh, birds and probably organisms on the planet. Um, bowerbirds spend even more time with their art than James can, uh, right? Uh, mostly because they have no parental care duties at all. Um, so uh, what are the bowerbirds? The bowerbirds are just uh, creating a, a, an object. It's not a nest. I uh, think of it as a seduction theater with one seat in it. It's, it's, a, it's a space in which the male uh, 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 works to attract females to display to, and then ultimately if they prefer him to mate. And, and, and so these are an example of an avenue bower with two sets of parallel walls. Uh, and, and bowerbirds also collect objects. They collect very specific things. In the case of the satin bowerbird, it's always blue objects. And in Australia, they can't help but bring blue trash. Uh, so here, every, every uh, non-wild uh, very or very distant bowerbird has human trash because they just can't resist of uh, bottle caps, and, but here he is with an actual feather, right? Uh, here's another species. The great bowerbird likes white things, uh, bones, uh, dried uh, and, and bleached twigs or, or, or bones. Uh, and this one in particular was uh, on the west coast of Australia. Uh, he's about a kilometer or two from the ocean. And on the, on the ocean in this place is a cliff, and in the middle of the cliff is a stratum. And in the middle of that stratum, are fossils, fossil bivalves. And this guy has an entire pile of fossils. And so this is a curatorial bowerbird, <laughs> right? And as a curator myself, I kind of relate to this guy. So when he's at the top of his tree, as he is in the morning singing to attract females to visit his bower, he's really saying, do you want to come over and see my fossil collection, <laughs> right? So this is a structure that is, it, it, uh, has architecture. It is a collage of objects uh, and, 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 and an amazing one. So here's another class of, of, of police. This is a maypole bower. It's kind of a Charlie Brown Christmas tree structure with a moat around it. And in that moat uh, is highly ornamented. So here's the male uh, placing one little berry amongst these other beautifully, vividly blue berries. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these uh, are actually gray stones. Another variety of bower is a, is a hut bower. So it has a maypole in the center with a roof over a side of it. And this is really one of the champions. The vocal cop bower bird has a, a great diversity of objects. Uh, here's an even more beautiful bower. Uh, this is taken by my former student, Brett Benz. Uh, here we see a whole bunch of objects. We'll start down here. This is uh, our dead beetles. They are black and shiny, right? So that's the pile of beetles. Uh, these are blue fruits uh, on their stems. And here we have a pile of, of uh, wood that has been uh, invaded by a greenish fungus. So this is sort of punky, rotten wood, right? And here we have a series of gelatinous red fruits. Um, and, and then here really is a, a, a sap. Uh, from a tree. It's, it's auburn goo in a pile, right? Uh, and then over here we have uh, rotting black things. Actually, when these red fruits turn rotten, they go over here. And then over here on the, on the side is a series of big, huge, waxy red flowers, right? It's extraordinary. They do all sorts of experiments. You take this, move it here, the bird will come right in and move it back. Um, and as you see, uh, different birds have different conceptions about what they like. Uh, they often are collecting similar objects in, 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 in the same parts of town or the same, same areas, right? Now, another entire aesthetic uh, realm is the role of parent 
offspring interaction, their parent offspring communication. So I talked about how parents, of course, will be making choices. They'll observe sensory perception, evaluation, uh, which, which, what do they look like, which is best, and then choices, including uh, feeding bird mouths or, uh, and attending to offspring, or as we'll see, laying, uh, 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 caring for eggs. So these are a, another realm, another non-sexual dimension of aesthetic evolution. And just to show that this really is a necessary uh, effect in the sciences, there was a paper just last month in the journal Nature about why coot chicks are so brilliant. Uh, and they determined that the parents are actually, uh, um, they're not indicators of quality, but they are, uh, they develop favorites. And so this elaborate set of plumage is involved in, 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 in um, acquiring human or, or, or parental attention. I think of that as cuteness, right? The co-evolved capacity uh, for, for, for engagement, right? And it extends prior to the birth of the organism with all sorts of choices uh, that are made, including eggs. So egg patterns feature in, in, in James's, uh, James's work. And here is one of the, one of the uh, fantastically complicated eggs. This is a, a common myrrh, which nests in colonies like this. There is no proper nest, just a cliff face, uh, a little guano around, and then, <laughs> and then, and then an egg. Uh, and so one of the features is if you're uh, 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 returning to your egg, you want to make sure you're taking care of your egg. Well, how do you know your egg from, uh, uh, you know, Jane and Bob's egg next door? Well, uh, uh, one way is for the egg to actually have signature, a private signal, a, a distinctive uh, pattern that allow you to recognize it. And, and, and that gives rise to this in, in, elaborate shape, uh, elaborate set of pigmentations. And uh, we're doing some research on how these are gained. Of course, uh, in, in James's work, he uh, compares this to, uh, to uh, this piece of work, Jackson Pollock, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'll leave it to him to comment on, uh, comment on that. Now, uh, the, uh, one more area, aesthetic choices. We talked about animals making choices about food plants or food objects like fruits. And here, for example, we see the hummingbirds. The hummingbirds are foraging around. They're sensory they're perceiving uh, flowers. Uh, they're choosing uh, which ones are worthwhile and then foraging. And as they do, they collect pollen on their head and then transport it again to another plant. So they affect pollination. So this is reproduction from the aspect of the plant, from the perspective of the plant, but it is ecological choices from the perspective of the, of the bird, right? And it gives rise to elaborate sets of floral beauty where the, uh, the birds are aesthetic agents in the evolution of the flowers. That could give rise to extraordinary things. Here we have the uh, sword-billed hummingbird that has a bill that is actually longer than the body of the bird. And it is a specialist and has co-evolved, again, with Brugmansia flowers, which are obviously amazing in many ways, uh, uh, but particularly with their size. And the bird actually has to fly up all the way inside with his wings down here and his bill reaching right back to the nectaries deep inside. Well, nature just doesn't, uh, doesn't do just beauty. There's a whole realm of warning uh, signals, what we call aposematism in nature, that are uh, telling you that these animals are noxious, venomous, horrible, right? So from the rattlesnake, coral snake, wasp, monarch butterflies, these uh, gorgeous poison dart frogs or the skunk are all communicating their, their, their noxiousness to you. And this is kind of a genre of horror in nature, right? So nature isn't just about beauty. It has all sorts of other things, and, and, I, and I think more complicated. So um, in closing, science, art, humanities, the post-humanities, um, why, why should we do this? What is the, what is the upside? For many people considering um, the, the, uh, the pigments on a bird egg or the song of a wood thrush as an art form is, is, is gone too far, right? But I think by reframing this uh, these sets of, 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 uh, of aesthetic phenomena in a common uh, dimension, I think we can achieve something r remarkable and positive. Uh, so what does the post-humanities have to give to us? And by post-human, I mean that we have taken the, the realm of aesthetics and redefined it in a way that we are no longer at the organizing center of the discipline, right? We're just one among many, 
right? And I think I would compare that to the history of cosmology, where we used to be considered, to, we used to consider ourselves to be the center of creation with everything rotating around us. And over the last 500 or so years, every discovery has led to a further, further uh, distancing from the organizing center of everything. We're, we're really in a cosmic nowheresville uh, now. Right? Well, I think that that has not, uh, not led to a diminishment of our understanding of ourselves, but actually an enhancement right? by, uh, by moving ourselves away from the organizing center. We can see for the first time uh, the ways in which we ourselves are remarkable and stand out. So I suggest that uh, a, a, a definition of art and aesthetics that encompasses nature uh, that is not organized around the human will be exactly the kind of perspective to understand uh, human aesthetics in, 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 in the appropriate extraordinary light. And so uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, and I look forward to further conversation with James. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Can, is my mic on? No, it's on. <laughs> um, it's great to see you all here, and thank you, Rick, for the wonderful and thought-provoking, beautiful talk. Um, I thought I'd give a couple-minute quick introduction to the exhibition for those of you who've seen it or haven't seen it. Uh, I'll show a couple images and try to keep it really brief so we can have a, a discussion and then some questions. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to uh, a few, very few people. Um, uh, I'll start with Jock Reynolds, former director of the museum, who invited me to do an artist residency here, where I first explored some of the ideas of this show of combining objects from the Peabody Museum of Natural History and the Art Gallery with some of my own works, combining um, objects made by animals like birds' nests with objects made by humans like baskets and asking questions like, you know, are, they, are we really that different from birds? <laughs> um, uh, Stephanie Wiles, uh, the current director who um, made the exhibition happen um, uh, with her generosity and support, uh, the exhibition wouldn't um, have happened and I'm grateful for that. Um, I think Stephanie and Dave Skelly, the, the director of the Peabody Museum, are interested in um, these kinds of conversations between or across disciplines. Uh, traditionally, some of these academic disciplines have been siloed, and maybe something good can happen from talking across <laughs> boundaries. A lot of my work is about boundaries and what they mean, and I'll, I'll say one or two words about that. Um, who else? Lawrence Cantor, who, I, who gave the introduction. I think Larry left, but thank you, Larry. He, he really, as the chief curator, um, he kind of took on this project, I think. I don't know if he volunteered or was forced, but um, in any case, I really enjoyed working with him uh, immensely, and he, he really helped edit and shape and hone uh, some of the thoughts and ideas in the exhibition and the publication. And uh, finally, Wakas Wajahat, my um, friend and art dealer who, who really influenced a lot of the exhibition and the ideas behind the scenes, which is, I think, how he likes it. He's on his phone. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, thanks again, Rick. I, I've followed Rick's work for a long time, and we've had many discussions about uh, things that are of interest to me, like how and why we name and order nature, what's a species, why even bother to divide nature into categories. Obviously, we have to to discuss them, but um, uh, I, some of you may know I have a, a long um, interest in trout. Uh, I, I won't go into my whole biography as I usually do when I give talks, but uh, I love these animals, and I think it's my what E.O. Wilson called biophilia, or what Rick's calling, you know, we love flowers and other animals are attracted to flowers. Why, why do we have these sort of parallel aesthetic senses? But for some reason, I was really drawn to birds first. My father introduced me to birds. Uh, and then, for some reason, trout. And I painted trout for, from nine years old to 22. I did a book on the trout in North America, then a book on trout around the world. 
And, and that led to some of these questions that I've had about, you know, how do we, how do we tr sort of split and name uh, a natural world that's really, you know, kind of a continuum. We've all evolved from camp common ancestors going back a long, long time. Sometimes it's really hard to know where to draw lines between things in order to label them. And I feel like once we label the pieces, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that there is this interconnectivity. Um, and that's partly what this bird spectrum is meant to illustrate. It's, it's made up of, it's upstairs, 222 birds from uh, the ornithology collection here. There's a, a roughly 150,000 specimens, and it's unorthodox for them to let somebody pin them to the wall of an art museum, so I have to <laughs> thank Rick for that. <laughs> and Christoph, who's not here, um, but they were bo both very um, open-minded, let's say, um, as well as moving things like dinosaur skulls into the museum. Um, but in this room, this, this work is juxtaposed with contemporary and modern and other works, feather, feather capes um, from Hawaii and Peru, some of which are thousands of years old, or um, the work of Helen Frankenthaler and, and Rothko and Morris Lewis, who test boundaries in their own way when they make paintings because of the, the pigment spills over, over each other. And that work is called Low Tide. And at the edges, um, I think there's a detail somewhere, but at the edges, it, it really feels like the, the conversation between the water and the shoreline um, and what happens when, when water seeps into the sand. And, and, and these pigment relationships and edges aren't, they're not clear lines, they're fuzzy and beautifully so. You can go upstairs and, and look at those. But this is what the bird bodies look like. There's, there's labels on them. They were collected all over the world over a long, long period of time. The oldest specimen, I think, in the spectrum is an extinct Carolina parakeet uh, collected in 1882. Sorry if this is becoming a lecture. I'll stop soon. <laughs> but Rick, as Rick knows, I think the fundamental commonality we have is a profound love of nature and getting to go to these sites to look at or collect specimens or, for me, being able to actually have tactile, a tactile relationship with these animals is really important. Um, as an artist, somehow, it, it's not just looking at the thing, but holding it and touching it. And that's, I think, partly what appealed to me so much about fishing, because you actually catch the thing and hold it in your hands. And um, humans make things, and birds make things. And the top left is a very old um, Syrian basket. It looks more like a hat to me, but I don't think we'll ever know what it was made for. But the weaving um, techniques are, are very similar to what birds do, and it's very possible that humans learn how to weave by watching weaver birds. Um, and I've had some great conversations with um, Ned Cook, an art historian here, about, about these things. But yeah, I mean, the materials like this hummingbird nest in the lower right is made of lichen and cobwebs. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, there's, there's an aspect of the exhibition that questions mark making, why humans make marks, what it meant when we first made a mark consciously on the wall of a cave or anywhere. Um, was that the first time that we could actually reflect on our own existence and think about self-awareness um, self as humans on this planet? Um, and I'll, I'll kind of end with this little, um, just explaining why the word artifice is in the show. Um, and it has to do in part with um, the origins of my interest in making representations or replicas of things in nature. I, I had a deep passion for fly fishing as a youth, and I, I still do to some extent. But when you go fishing with these things, you make it an Im imitation of the insect with the materials of something else, like feathers or fur, tie them to a hook, and you throw it out to a fish. And um, it occurred to me at some point that, that making representations or, or mimicry or imitation is something that a lot of animals do as a survival um, method. You know, some animals evolve to look like toxic species like monarch butterflies and other species of butterflies, so they get the benefits of toxicity. There's, there's many, many examples, but in any case, um, I think in, uh, from listening to Rick, part of what um, struck me is he, he seems to be trying to get into the mind of the bird or the mind of the animal, which we'll never unfortunately be able to see uh, what a bird sees or what a shrimp sees or a fish, but we can try to um, understand it. For me, when you throw a, a lure or a fly out to a fish that you've made, if a fish acknowledges it, even stops to look at it, it means that they also think it looks like an insect. And you've engaged them in this 
secondary world, this imitation world that you've created. And I think it's the closest I've ever come to a human, non-human kind of communication. But it, it, at times you feel that the fish um, isn't really that much different than you. Um, and I'll, I'll try to stop <laughs> if that makes any sense. But we, you know, we also, um, in the upper left, there's a picture um, by George Catlin of these indigenous people dressed like in wolf skins to go hunting for bison uh, because the, the bison are less prone to run away from a wolf than they are a human. So they'd sneak up on them with their spears and, and arrows and things. Um, but it wasn't just about imitating nature to become a more efficient predator. It was about almost kind of becoming nature, getting in the mind of, of animals and things. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> I could keep going, but uh, so what do you, should we talk so, about? So, so, <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I, I propose the, the, the uh, animal art worlds as a, as a, as a, as a, as a provocation. And uh, my first question is, you know, uh, well, what does that, what does that provoke? Uh, the idea that uh, some of the, um, uh, some of the well, yeah, some the of the objects in, yeah. in, 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 in spectrum or elsewhere in your, are, are in, uh, in in some frame you know uh, uh, could be considered artworks in their own right uh, prior well, to that placement right and and you were talking about how the you know the the aesthetic object let's say the male bird evolves co-evolves with the taste of the female um, it's essentially female birds. Um, in part, individual aesthetic choices that led to those birds being so beautiful and having all that diversity. Um, but it also made me think of the co-evolutionary relationship between an artist and the patron, you know, because the artist has to make something that's pretty enough for a patron to want to buy. <laughs> and in a, in a practical way, there's, there's so many of these relationships that, as Rick was saying, shape the future of what art looks like. Um, this is the detail of that Frankenthaler painting. And, you know, it, these things move us somehow. And what what is that? What is beauty? I mean, you, Rick has explored this in a lot of his writing, but what is beauty, Rick? <laughs> well, I, 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 I had that in slide four, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, well, I but I, I but I but more. but I think but I I think the uh, the 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 interesting thing about the spectrum to me, of course, is lots of things about it. One is uh, you know uh, it's human vision that's aligned it. To your vision, right, right, and uh, uh, not avian vision. But then again, as well, the the you know the reason why the spectrum is available for you to sample and create that work it, it, it is, I think, something about the aesthetic lives of birds themselves have driven that diversity, made it possible, right? That uh, if you did. Uh, if you took a bunch of moles, which don't see <laughs> in color, and line them on the wall, you could not make a spectrum. But if we were doing, if we had an olfactory museum, uh, then then uh, you know maybe maybe the moles uh, would have a, a breadth of a breadth of uh, of uh, you know stimuli that we uh, that we that we can't comprehend. Or and the comprehend. and the because Rick studies bird vision and what they can see and we can, I'll just ask him, what would that look like to a bird? That yeah, well, <laughs> it, 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 um, complicated, because birds are, are both diverse in how they see. But one thing we know is that we see an RGB, red, green, blue, right? And we can imagine a, a, a ternary diagram or a, a CIE space, right, which is just a little flat description of all the available colors, right? But birds see RGB UV. So that means that they have a three-dimensional color world meaning that many of the things that are yellow and green in the spectrum are actually vividly distinct to birds. They're ultraviolet yellow or ultraviolet green, which are colors as different from yellow or green as purple is from red or blue, right? They're mixtures of non-adjacent colors. So um, uh, to the bird, some of those colors would be popping out in a whole other way. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a distinct feature, right? So that's bird spectrum. Is is authored by a human. Authored by what? A human. A human. Yeah. Yeah. What about bird eggs? Should we? <laughs> I think there's a slide of. Oh, I was gonna say because um, there's a section in the show also called the spaces in between, and it's kind of about acknowledging that the space that we can't see, 
that humans can't see is actually very important, and, and science is starting to um, uh, figure out things about what's happening in that space. Like, for instance, trees can communicate uh, with hormones through the overstory or under the ground through um, um, mycorrhizal networks, right? And you're, in a sense, studying things that humans can't see, but are actually affecting how everything that we see is shaped and comes about. Anything to say about that? <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, one of the striking features in the show was this uh, comparison uh, between, that was striking for me, was a comparison between the bird egg and the, and the, and the was it? Uh, Bryce, Bryce Martin. Martin, yeah. Martin research, I think he's coming up. I think. Could, yeah. So here we have this, the go egg. back to the egg. We have this egg, right, which is saying so we've been doing work uh, on trying to understand, you know, how we de-engineer, -un -de re-unengineer these eggs, trying to figure out what was required to make them. And these eggs are formed in the oviduct of the bird with a series of uh, uh, cells on the inside that create the pigments that are released into the lumen and then become incorporated in the egg as, as it grows. So this is a kind of printing mechanism. Uh, I don't think there's any other form of printing, color printing, in outside of us uh, that, 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 that's been produced. But you can see what, one of the ways in which they get streaks is to turn on a brush and then move the egg either up and down or rotate it around. And if you see the, 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 the streaks that are going around in a circle on the bottom of the egg, those are uh, 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 brush strokes, but with a very uh, unusual form. But uh, also, as they continue to see, let me see the pointer. As you continue to see, you can see uh, here, is a, here are patches uh, that were spots that were laid down, uh, but have since been obscured by the deposition mechanism. Or another layer of calcium and, or something. Right, and, 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 and here we see, in, as you observed in, in Vine, <laughs> Uh, Martin creating a series of strokes and then, and, then, and then continuing to paint over them, obscure some of them with additional whitish background pigment, right? So these, these are, uh, it, it, you know, extraordinary sets of, uh, of uh, you Maybe know, mind-like signatures. Maybe the depth perception depth, or something. Right, right. But that, yeah, I, just in the stuff I've read about why they think these marks are on the eggs. If you look in the, in the exhibition, there's, there's three eggs. The mer egg is pretty big, but the, the grackle egg is about that big. And there's lines that are, I don't know what human instrument could make lines that thin. But um, you know, when a female lays a clutch of egg and eggs, and Rick, Rick can correct me, <laughs> um, let's say there's three or four eggs in the nest. Um, there are parasitic birds like cuckoos or cowbirds that don't make their own nests that will lay their eggs in the, the um, nest of, let's say, a, a grackle. And um, as Rick said, the, the signatures are unique. So the female uh, gets to know her um, individual signatures on each egg as they're laid, almost as if they're names or a, a form of, of writing. So that if a foreign egg is deposited in the nest, she can sort of push it out before it hatches. And it seems once they hatch, the the chick kind of appeals to the motherly instincts more, so it's better if she can get it out beforehand. But, um, but the the other sort of fun thing is there's this almost painting forgery thing happening where the the parasitic bird is evolving patterns on its eggs that will mimic the patterns on the female uh, uh, female who made the nest's eggs, and. Um, so it's this mimicry, and, and, and you see it also, another reason the patterns are on the eggs is for camouflage. So, you know, seabirds might lay their eggs on, on stones or beach sands that don't have nests. Um, but the egg has evolved to mimic the patterns on the, the stones and the um, nests. And so you could almost look at it as a form of representational painting, like a landscape painting, essentially painting a landscape of a beach or a stone on a... On a um, on, a, on an egg, and if you're familiar with Via Selman's work, she'll, she'll take like a stone from the beach and then make another one out of another material, bronze, and then paint it to look exactly like the original stone. And it's a, it's a process that seems like artists and, and human artists and non-human artists <laughs> do over and over again, or, or these lines made by um, abstract expressionist artists, part of the goal of 
making these lines was that they wanted to make a line that was outside of human thought or a mark that was unconscious. They call it automatism. And they can't, I mean, it's really hard for a human to turn off their brains. And birds make a more pure form of unconscious mark than we can because it's made in the body of their birds and I don't think they're thinking about it, right? <laughs> so what the surrealists and the abex artists were trying to do, a bird does very handily. Uh, for different reasons and a different process, but they're just, I, I think, I just find them to be incredibly beautiful and, and putting these things together just makes us think, well, what's, so, what are the differences? You know? so, so Jane, before we go to questions, let's, uh, let's ask uh, about hybridity. Uh, what's the hybridity of Why hybrids? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I put any pictures of hybrids yeah, in there. To... Well, part of it is, uh, you know, I paint these sort of half, sometimes half human, half animal things. I'm, there's a picture in the show of my head on the body of a red-tailed hawk. Um, and, uh, or, you know, the first hybrids I started to do were related to my questions about how and why we name things. And I, I kept feeling like when we put names on things or labels, our minds draw boxes around them and then we forget about those invisible spaces in between that, that you kind of explore in your work. And, and uh, hybrids have been being made by humans going back a long, long time. They just discovered this new cave painting in Indonesia somewhere. And, and uh, they think it's older than the ones in Lascaux and Chauvet and um, Altamira. And some of the, the figures are half human, half animal hybrids. And um, part of what attracts me to hybrids is that when you combine two animals or two things, you get something that's novel that for at least a short amount of time escapes its definition or, or isn't named. Um, so it, it sort of lives in that liminal space. And I'm attracted to that, that liminality, that place between this and that, that boundary area. And it, and it surfaces again and again in, in the themes of the show. Um, for instance, there's, I write about in the book this, this group in Siberia that um, they dress like elk when they go elk hunting. They put on you know, an actual coat with antlers. And, and um, these anthropologists have written about, there's a, there's a point at which, and then they imitate the, the movements of the elk to attract the elk to, to kill them, to eat. <laughs> but there's a point at which, the, in, the in the course of the imitation, the, the person, um, if their imitation is too good, they can cross into becoming an elk and then they can't come back to being human again. <laughs> and I just love that idea of like, when does, when, does, um, when does a definition fail? When is a human no longer a human? When does it pass into another realm? Um, and that's sort of a, a hybrid zone. There's, so, I, so, could, so, I could show one more picture. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, right? There's, we might have to go through a few to get there. <laughs> um, what were you going to say, Rick? Sorry. Oh, maybe it's not here. No, there's the picture of the hybrid. Back one. Oh, there's a hybrid. Yeah, I had something else I was going to show, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's uh, drive this uh, event to another liminal realm. Nice. We'll hybridize with some questions from the audience. Hybridize our that? brain. <laughs> Uh, questions out there. We see, uh, and I think there are folks with uh, mics uh, since we're being recorded, and uh, we'll let you run them because we can't see them. Hi. Yeah. Thank you both for such a wonderful series of commentaries. Uh, James, a, a question for you. Uh, can you talk about how you created the bird spectrum assemblage? How, how long it took? It's, how did you go about selecting who was in, who wasn't in, right. uh, who went where, how did you, can I you talk the, about uh, that? And then, what, if I can, before I get the mic back, one other question. People have been painting fish and eating fish for a long time. Does that pose any issues for you today? Because there's been a rather recent idea about maybe we shouldn't eat fish. Shouldn't eat fish? Hmm. Some people feel that way. Um, I, when I was deep in my fishing passion, I let a lot of them go, but I have nothing against people eating fish. But that's, that's, a, that's a deep uh, topic. How they're harvested you know, matters to me. And, but I find that I, 
I fish a lot less than I did when I was a kid. I only really fly fished one day last year, and I think I'm. <laughs> I think I think more about what it means to hook something, torture it, and let it go. Um, and I, as I get older, maybe I sympathize more with the animal. But uh, and instead of doing that, maybe it might be more humane to actually keep it and eat it <laughs> than torture it and let it go. Uh, in any case, the bird the bird spectrum really goes back a long time for me, and, and it's partly a, a tribute to, um, if I can be um, uh, presumptuous enough to call you a friend, <laughs> my friendship with uh, Rick and Christoph, uh, who kind of oversee the collection, uh, expand the collection. It's a, it's a diverse collection. I, I've, I've been a curatorial affiliate at the Peabody which doesn't really mean a whole lot since 2011, but kind of a volunteer curator in the, the zoology department. I've learned how to skin, skin and prepare specimens. I've gone on collecting trips. I've helped you know, some, some dead birds and collections come to the, to the Peabody from places like zoos where they die and they you know, can be used by scientists to do research on color and stuff. Um, so I'm not sure maybe Rick can answer this. If, if I was just some schmo walking off the street, would you have let me pin all the birds to the wall? <laughs> no, 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 no. But not that I'm in, yeah, yeah. have no, any but, yeah, validity, the, but the, I've spent the, my time there. You, you, yeah, you have, you browse through the collection to compose the right, uh, the right but, uh, set of but birds. But in terms and, of... And there were some that we would not allow. Yeah, Rick looked, Rick, Rick reviewed the list and, and rightly so. There's th these there were a lot of discussions, you know, the, the specimens are irreplaceable. You can't replace a dead Carolina parakeet because they're extinct. Um, so to scientists and artists, these specimens are extremely valuable. Um, the, but the, the process, I'll, I'll try to complete the thought quickly. Um, it took a long time. There were two, good part of two summers going back and forth to the collections, photographing each bird and then arranging it digitally in, um, in Photoshop or Adobe Illustrator. Um, and then we ultimately printed a template life size uh, where each bird was photographed and put back in the collection. So I'd never actually seen it with the actual birds until a couple of weeks ago when the exhibition was mounted. So we created a template, printed it life size, and then Michael Anderson, a preparator at the Peabody, pinned them into position. Most of them with just one pin, so they're not um, being harmed too much. There was also a long discussion, um, mostly with Rick, about um, whether we were going to cover the birds or not, um, because um, obviously if they're not covered, they're vulnerable to lots of things, theft or whatever could happen. But um, So it, the, the discussion was really about if, if they weren't covered, we would have had to put a huge stanchion in front of them so people couldn't get close, but it's nice, I think, now that Rick was pushing for them to be covered, and rightly so, um, because they're protected, but people can also get right up to them and, and look at the, the beauty of these animals, which is really what drew me to wanting to, to do the thing, but um, thank you. Hi. Um, so, Rick, earlier you touched on uh, birds evolving in terms of cuteness, like the American coot, how the babies became more cute so that it would attract the parents. Um, obviously, humans find some animals more attractive than others. Do you think that humans could encourage that same type of evolution over a long period of time? Like, obviously, we see it now in the you pick the cutest puppy in the animal shelter, or there are these chari charismatic flagstaff species like sea otters, yeah. where humans tend to advocate for their survival over others. Do you Abs think that animals Absolutely. Could I think that the human responses to cuteness uh, both have driven you know, conservation priorities, but also have driven artificial selection, the evolution of uh, domestic forms. Uh, you know, when, uh, uh, when the origin of species went out uh, for review, uh, John Murray sent it to a couple of people, and one of the reviews came back uh, and said, uh, 
all this evolution stuff is kind of confusing, but I think a book about pigeons would sell nicely, right? <laughs> and 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 because it was a lot about pigeons. I mean, so Darwin was very interested in artificial selection and how it could give rise to change uh, as an analogy for you know uh, what was going on in the natural world. But clearly, we've had a huge impact on puppies. And then there's the whole like uh, baby Yoda uh, genre, <laughs> right? Our fantasy of cuteness in other galaxies, right? Uh, which is which is uh, which is a uh, powerful. James, is it on? Do I have to do anything? No. <laughs> James, I'm wondering. You mentioned that um, handling the objects or animals is really important to you, and I was wondering on the the eggs. Um, did you were you inspired by the pattern on the egg, and that caused you to paint, or did you actually get into the science of how those patterns occurred? And do you have a strong interest in the sciences? Did you? Look at that first, and that added to your inspiration. Um, yeah, I, I guess. Um, Which came first, the painting or the egg? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was asking um, myself over the years which came first, Pollock or the egg, because you know his wife and probably him, but um, in particular, uh, help me out, um, Lee Krasner. Um, uh, she had a collection of stuff she brought back from the beach near their house in East Hampton, and there were rocks and shells, and I'm sure there were what would be a, a seabird, a tern maybe, or something that might have uh, those beautiful squiggles, and maybe Pollock was imitating that. I, I think I just, again, had an um, intense love of nature from an early age, and um, my father, who's sitting, sitting here, um, I was, I, drawing, I think, came first for me. Um, just as a way of, I don't know why I did it, it's just an impulse and exploring, uh, you know, I don't know, I just always like to draw. And um, so part of what I've asked myself over the years is why do humans draw? But that's another lecture probably. Uh, but my dad um, introduced me at the same time, he, he loved birds, so we had the field guides, Peterson's field guide and other ones, and, and, and we would identify and learn the names of the birds. But he was also reading um, some of these popular evolutionary biologists at the time, um, Stephen Jay Gould and E.O. Wilson, and, and he also taught astronomy. So um, all those things together, and he was also reading Robert Frost poems to me. So it, it was never like that these productions of, of humans and nature were really different. They were just all part of the same inquiry. So. I, I never was trained as a scientist. I didn't go to school to become a scientist. Um, if I'd had different mentors, maybe it would have gone in a different direction. But I studied architecture at Yale and then ended up majoring in English literature. But that's just what happened. Um, those, those, those rollouts of the eggs, incidentally, um, are not paintings. I don't know if you thought they were, but they're, we actually made essentially 3D scans of the eggs and unwrap them. Um, I think they call it a Mercator projection. So those are the actual eggs unwrapped and blown up so you can see the, the details at a larger scale. So maybe just a couple more questions. I know there are some eager hands out there. <laughs> so um, is this on? Yes. So uh, when you were uh, talking, Rick, um, I thought that the uh, fundamental question you were asking was, what is beauty? And then um, I was, uh, as I was sort of reflecting on that, I uh, it was uh, chewing on it as, uh, uh, what's truth? You know, there's a famous quote of uh, some Jeez. physicist who said, you know, it was so beautiful, I knew it had to be true. Um, <laughs> so I was, I was thinking that there's a kind of, uh, pursuit, you know, so you have this, uh, you know, like, what is beauty, what is truth, you know, what is life, what is knowing, and then all of this happens for, in this co-evolutionary way by reflecting, right, so, so in a way, how do we reflect our knowing that we're alive and that it's beautiful. It, it seems that you're, uh, yeah. you're uh, hammering away at those issues, you know, to uh, eliminate 
the mirror and uh, just get the reflection itself. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I spent a lot of time uh, concerned with, with, uh, with truth uh, and beauty, and, and I find that they are rarely uh, uh, associated, and that, that, that uh, so uh, I think that's been a, a, a fascinating intellectual move. It's been certainly uh, influential in biology, where most people think that the beauty of the peacock or whatever is communicating information about quality, kind of a biological match.com profile of, uh, of, of make quality, and I find that to be a very diminished in, uh, view of beauty. And uh, uh, so my book is basically about that and a, and, a, and a critical view. What I really think is going on is, is, a, is a myriad of art worlds that are as a, um, uh, susceptible to change and uh, unconstrained as you know, high fashion uh, from season to season, but uh, with even greater uh, diversity because it's uh, snails and flowers and, and all, these, all these other things. When you say that the uh, beauty uh, to the peacock, even uh, you and I can recognize it? Yeah, well, that, that, that's a fascinating thing, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would call that the graduate level uh, questions of beauty <laughs> studies. Uh, um, you know, let's get, let's get the phenomenon straight and then ask why do we appreciate it, right? Uh, the short answer is, I think, uh, that, yeah, we share a lot of the sensory modalities. In some cases, it's physics, like, you know, musical notes of that wood thrush are actually waves with harmonic relations, and uh, they're experiencing many of the same kind of sensations that we get when we hear complex uh, uh, acoustics. So that may, be, that may be part of it, but um, you know, in fact, we are outside of their art world. We are not participants, we are not active, and so uh, that means we can't be causally related to, to, to why it's that way. And, uh, and that's part of what uh, gets me up in the morning and makes <laughs> me feel alive. So, uh, and, uh, and, and my book is about communicating uh, you know, that, that science mission. There's one hand been going up in the last row back here, this guy in the white shirt. Uh, he's, he, he was in the first 10 seconds. And, uh, uh, let, 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 let's hear from him. And maybe uh, another question as well. But. I'm, I'm curious in the same way that uh, humans have art trends and movements, have you seen or noticed any um, similar things in aesthetic uh, evolution? So do you, like, were there textures or colors that were more effective in certain geological eras than others. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, because we're, we're always interested in uh, what is uh, available, like the limitations in the, the organism's capacity to make a signal, either a color or a sound, et cetera, uh, or um, uh, versus uh, just the, the sensory capacity to see or to perceive, right? And then there's this, the preference or the ecological opportunity for choices. All those things can influence whether or not something happens. But for example, one of the, in, in the family birds I work a lot on, mannequins, they do a lot of dances and they have often evolved mechanical sounds, that is non-vocal sounds that are made pops and snaps that are made with their wings, right? So there's a whole other way to make sound and it seems to have emerged from their great activity. Uh, doing dances, making incidental noises, which then become subject to, to, to preferences and evolve into explicit noises. But yeah, we're interested in how, how, that, how those trends and things can happen, and uh, there are ways to connect those aesthetic expressions to the biology of the bird that I think are, uh, uh, are fascinating. And lastly, over here. Hello. Oh, hi. Um, thank you for this talk. It's been really enlightening. Uh, and obviously there's been a clear emphasis on communication uh, and with that emphasis a lot of the organisms we've been talking about have been sexual organisms. Uh, my question is what's your take on asexual organisms where there isn't a clear incentive uh, for communication where it's just the, the singular organism, uh, it's asexually reproducing and there really isn't an explicit like, purpose for communication. Uh, what's your take on those? and kind of like, I guess, maybe the philosophical uh, maybe representations. Sure. You know, my, my view on the, on the aesthetic is that it's, it's, it, like I say, it was an emergent consequence of, of sensory perception, uh, cognitive evaluation, you know, judgment, and then the choice, the opportunity to enact choice. And um, uh, those can happen in, in sexual contexts, in ecological contexts, et cetera. But for example, you know, the, the warning coloration, whether it's the, the coral snake, 
uh, the coral snake uh, is, is brilliantly colored. It's communicating, don't mess with me because uh, if, you, if you do, I'll bite you. And that's, of course, risky for the snake. The snake would rather be just be left alone, right? Um, now, the snake is a sexual organism, uh, but there are, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, I'm sure, asexual species that are involved in aposematic or warning colorations, right? So, uh, but there are, awesome, uh, there are often lots of realms of biology, many organisms that do not have aesthetic lives. They don't have the opportunity for choice. They don't have the cognitive uh, capacity to, to, to make choice, or they may not have the sensory bandwidth outside of some narrow ecological thing. Though this is uh, uh, not uh, something we share with organisms. It's something that has emerged many times independently in diverse places in the history of life, right? And that makes it even more uh, you know, diverse. So um, I'm sure there are asexual organisms with aesthetic lives, but I don't know of one right off the top of my head. And there's many that we, we find beautiful, like those little water bears and <laughs> Indeed, amoebas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>